Hi everyone. Now, this week, uh, quite a lot went on. There's three main things that I want to talk about. Phantom limb pain is never anything I've ever had to de deal with. I had no pain at all until um, after they chopped my leg off at all. And so I've never had any trouble with pain until now. And it's been, it came as quite a shock and it's not common to develop uh, um, phantom limb pain at this stage, sort of eight, nine months after an amputation. So they wanted to get on top of it quite quickly. I was offered two different solutions. I could be referred to the pain team or the physio. I asked what the pain team involved and they said drugs. No, I'm not doing that. We're not taking, I'm not taking drugs. We'll try physio. What does that involve? And my physiotherapist talked to me about a, a whole bundle of things which actually sound like um, claptrap, some of it, but I will tell you how it's been going afterwards. So the first thing he talk, talked to me about was the sensory homunculus, and this is a picture representation of it. So basically what it is, is the theory that the, there are certain parts of the brain that deal with different types of motor functions. And fine motor function requires more of the brain to deal with, obviously. So the face and the hands take up a larger space. Um, now, when uh, the brain suddenly stops getting signals from a body part because the body part is missing, it's still looking for those signals from that body part. And sometimes these signals get a little bit muddled up. So if there is, you're walking on a prosthetic leg or, or you touch it, squeeze it, tap it, whatever. I have talked about tapping briefly in the past. Then that reminds the brain this is where the leg ends and it sort of corrects the whole thing. Now, I did that right from the beginning. As soon as I was out of theatre, I wanted to look at it, touch it, feel it. And every time I had um, phantom pins and needles, I would squeeze my stump and it would stop. So I've never had any issues. But at the weekend, just maybe the last week, I've st I started getting phantom limb pain in my knot foot. And uh, this coincided with spending a lot of time last weekend in Auckland sitting in a wheelchair because I knew that I wouldn't be able to walk as far as I was required. So here comes the next little bit of theory. So I said, why did I, why was it when I was sitting down resting it, it was worse? Now, the, the physiotherapist explained it like this. So your brain is looking for a signal and it doesn't get one. Now, if you are walking around on a, on a prosthetic, it's reminding the brain, oh yes, that's where it ends. Yes, yes, I remember now. But if you don't get a, if the brain does not get a signal from anywhere because you're sitting down, you know, it, I'm not using my legs, then it goes, hmm, and then starts to make stuff up. So it'll pinch things from um, adjacent areas in the brain, and then you start getting, um, phantom pain, maybe pain in other places, that sort of thing. Because the brain is confused because you aren't giving it signals to remind it that your leg's not there. I thought, well, that's curious. So obviously squeezing, touching, tapping, all that sort of thing was something that I was told to do and continue doing. And then the next thing is mirror therapy. Now, I knew that mirror therapy uh, existed and I also knew um, that for some people it really does work very well. Um, I've read it in biogra various biographies and people who've lost limbs and it sort of works like this. So what we've got to do is cover up the left leg, not move it, don't, you know, at all. And so I can't see it and a mirror reflects my right leg. Now we did this in physio earlier on in the week. First time I looked at it, it was like, whoa, that's weird, seeing two feet again. And he was like, yeah, this is why they don't use mirror therapy right at the beginning, because it could, you know, um, mess with your brain if you haven't completely accepted the loss of the limb and that sort of thing. It could be quite traumatic seeing that. But um, we're past that. I know the leg's gone. Uh, so he said, right, uh, he wanted me to look at the mirror, wiggle my foot around, and move, keep on moving it, keep on watching it, and imagine that I'm moving my left leg as well. I was like, um, and told me I had to be open 
to um to this so um sort of believe that it was going to happen i have also got to imagine i'm walking with two feet when i'm walking around imagine i'm cycling with two feet when i'm cycling um all that sort of thing and this is another way of dealing with it because it fools the brain into thinking there is a foot there so that is um means it doesn't need to give you the pain signals because there is a foot now this is all like mm, okay and then the last thing he told me to do was download an app now in this app what i have to do is play this little game where i've got to it's distinguish left and right and it shows me various pictures of left and right feet and when we first did this i was like uh, really and i downloaded it whilst i was at physio and did it a few times and my response time was well within the what was expected and accuracy was 100 percent so it's like, OK, so your brain doesn't have any trouble with that. Sometimes your brain has trouble recognising left from right if a body part on one side has gone. Uh, has gone. It sort of messes with the brain signals. So, was, mm. so he said, but anyway, keep doing it anyway. Do it at different times of day. There's some uh, research that suggests that it uh, could be connected. The dif difficulty with it, this could be connected to emotions, situations and places and that sort of thing, you know, associations with what had happened. So I thought, OK, all right, we'll do that. So I did it for a couple of days and I did, and really the only time I was doing it was in the evening. Um, between the two physio sessions, it was only two days and I did it in the morning and I did it in the evening. And there's various different types of these tests within this app and it gives you results and you're able to download them and all this sort of thing. So I showed him the results the um, next time I went in and my accuracy was still 100% and good response time in the morning. But interestingly, in the evening, even on days when I didn't feel tired, the first time I did it, I thought I'd had a pretty good day and was feeling pretty, pretty good. And I hadn't done too much, too, too much that was too stressful. And the accuracy was down to 80 percent. And the left foot accuracy was worse than the right foot. And this has been consistently the case in the evening when I'm mentally tired, more tired than you would be if you just got up in the morning. And that is really curious because I know what a left and a right foot looks like. Yeah, but mm, there's obviously a whole lot more to the brain than we know. So I've been doing the app every, uh, every uh, you know, every day, a couple of times a day. And I've also been doing the mirror therapy as well in the morning and the evening. I take the mirror off the wall and stick to my knees and pretend I'm moving my feet. And what has happened with that? Well, actually the phantom foot pain has gone now i wanted it to be true the theory and the science behind it was making me go hmm but it is working so i found that really really interesting the next thing we were trying to sort out this week was the bike now i took my cervello into uh, cycle world in dunedin and they do retool bike fits computerized bike fits i've had it done to my bike before that's how the bike got set up originally and so i knew that they knew their stuff and i went into the shop and asked did they have a retool fitter who was used to dealing with amputees and they said they did uh so i thought perfect so i took the bike ups there and booked it in for a bike fit because I knew what the the setup with the bike was not working for me, uh, but I couldn't work out why not. Now, when you, um, when I bought a bike sort of 12 years ago, bikes were made to be very aero. They believed that everything to do with speed was in the aerodynamics. So you were all very tucked in, all very aerodynamic. And that's how bikes were made. And that's how mine was made because mine's 12 years old. So when I rode that bike, I you'd, you'd be able to put a plate on my back. My back was level and it was always super, super comfortable. But since I've been back on the bike with my makeshift bike legs, it's never really worked for me. And I've had to always sit up straight. And I was asking the physio why I, this was the case. And he said, when you close up the hip angle, you lose power through the leg. The bike fitter told me that the, they've discovered this when they in, in later years in bike making bikes and now there's less focus on the 
aerodynamics and it's a bit more of a balancing act between aerodynamics and your hip angle. He was also telling me that there was someone in the bike shop that had had a bike fit done by uh, a high up um, specialist guy in Christchurch and they'd put him into an aer aero tuck position because th this is what they believe was the most aer um, the most efficient for doing time trialing, which is you know, speed racing. Um, and he actually went slower because they closed his hip angle up. So I was like, hmm. Now, we got my bike onto the trainer and fiddled around. Now, we all sort of went poof when it came to trying to work out what the devil was going on with left and right. So we thought, right, forget the left leg, let's fix the right leg. So we had to lift the handlebars up and up and up and up. And we had to put three risers onto the forks because my bike's so old, it was the tuck position, the forks are short began to look a bit silly and then we had to lift the seat up and the seat went up and up and up and he was measuring the angle of my knee because there's an optimum angle for the extension of your leg for it to be you know the best power ratio and couldn't get the seat high enough because there wasn't enough seat post now the problem with that is my bike is 12 years old so we can't get parts that added to that the handlebars had been raised by about this much off the front wheel which majorly would change the handling of the bike and I started to get a bit worried about whether it would actually be safe to ride with so many modifications added to it because bikes are made ergodynamically and you know they, they measure all the angles and blah blah blah, blah. and so I was like Mwah. and when we got to the seat post part and we couldn't get the seat high enough he said right you need to make a decision now what are we going to do and then pulled out a bike from behind this, the shelf and went, this one would work. I was like, oh, really? Now, I was kind of hoping that they could make the Cervelo work. But in my heart of hearts, I had to sit up so tall to make it work when I was pedalling it here on the trainer. I wasn't entirely surprised that we couldn't make it work. So they ended up telling me they couldn't do it. So this is what we ended up with. The Cervelo's racing position was a lot more of a tuck position right down here. So my back was flat. But what that means is the more, the, the smaller the hip angle, the less power you have through the quad. And bike makers have figured this out and now make new bikes differently. So my Cervelo's got very short forks at the front here. This one is a lot longer and there's a lot more adjustment here and here and here. So that meant that we could get the front higher. So if you look at my position here, it's a lot more upright than my bike used to be before. It also means that we had to lengthen the bike leg quite considerably. It's now longer than my other leg, which is correct if you think about it, because there's no foot on the end. Uh, but when I'm standing up, they're pretty much level. And what that also means then is we've got the right angle through the knee. And I don't have my elbow banging against my other knee. So I can ride quite comfortably in this position here. And... For the first time since I've got back on a bike, if there really ever was a similarity, my left leg feels more similar to my right leg than it ever has before. I did not want to buy a bike, trust me, because I love my Cervelo. I've had it for 12 years and it has gone all around the world with me, but it just won't do what my I need it to do for a prosthetic leg anymore. So we had to change. So now I've wrapped my head around the fact that I had to buy a bike. I'm getting all my bike parts out, back out of the garage and I'm, I've blown the dust, literally, off my carbon wheels and I've got them back in the bike shop, having them put back together so we can put the carbon wheels back on my new racing bike, which is a specialised shiv. It's a different make, but there is such a big problem with getting bikes and bike parts and frames and things like that 
right up and down the country that I almost bit his arm off when he said this they had this one it was my size so my Cervelo which I've had for 12 years has taken me right around the world for all of my international races has now been retired and is up for sale in order to help me uh, recuperate some of the costs for the new bike. I just can't use it so someone else might as well because there is nothing wrong with it at all. So then I had to be taught how to do bit, change the bits on the end of the foot because I've got this dual temp that's still got the temporary bike leg but it's got two fitments on the end because the pedal on the time trial bike is different to the pedal on the mountain bike. I have got no intention of going anywhere outside on this time trial bike anytime soon because first I need to get used to riding the riding position, second I need to build up the distance and third I need to work out how the heck to stop and start and get on and off because I can't put a dropper post onto the time trial bike. So I'm going to stick with the mountain bike outside and I am not going outside when the weather is awful because I'm really conscious of the health and sa uh, the safety issues with me um, not only having one foot that I can stand on. So I've got to work, I've got to know how to change the part on the end to, from a mountain bike to a road bike. So added to my bike kit is now two 4 mil Allen keys and a spare foot. Now I've just changed it over to the mountain bike foot. And um, this is the road bike foot. And yeah, so I this is how I changed them over. The last piece of news, well, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine was um, nominated for a sports award locally and she got through to the to the final and the finalists were all invited to a, sort of like a posh dinner and then the, um, at the dinner they announced who win, who wins. And she put a table together and asked, did I want to come? And I was like, uh. so first going somewhere where you've got to dress posh and I did not want to wear trousers but I was like what the hell do I wear and then once I found a skirt that I could that I thought was all right and then I thought shoes what do we do with shoes um hmm because I figured slip-on shoes would be a disaster and I didn't have any other types of shoes I'd actually had put all my shoes in a bag and I was going to take them to an op shop but I hadn't got around to it so I thought and then I I rummaged around shoe shops, got nowhere, and then figured eventually that I would go back and try the slip-on shoes. So I found a pair of slip-on shoes that were reasonably tight and prized them over the foot shell and got them on. But the problem then was each, each when I'm walking because the foot shell is plastic. So I was like, oh. So then I had to go and figure out a solution for that. And this was my solution. to treat because I it didn't it got rid of my squeak I could keep the sh both the shoes on it didn't slide off and it was all right and the top that I chose to wear was also reasonably matchy matchy to the uh, limb cover I've got at the moment so this was my final outfit so yes it was um, a bit of a momentous day really because I went somewhere on my own that normally it would be partners. I said, there's two things here, Liz. I'll come if I'm not going to be like Billy, Billy no mates coming by myself and I don't have to wear a ball gown. And she said, no, 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 both all right. So I decided to go. And the second thing was being in a skirt and shoes for the first time since my amputation. And... I know to begin with, I had the leg on show, it was the summer and we were playing around with all the different types of covers and things. But since then, I've sort of kept it covered up um, because I was still wrapping my head around the whole self-image part of it. So actually wearing a skirt and having the leg showing was a really big thing for me. And in fact, 
it was fine and everybody loved it and they were all looking at looking at the limb cover and um wow you got a skirt on and they were actually more um focused on the fact that i was dressed up with makeup and things because i don't normally do that so it went really well and i'm really really pleased that i did it now you need to stay tuned because my next task I've nearly talked myself out of this a few times. I'm going to say it out loud so I can't. Um, tomorrow, there is a local duathlon here um, run by the local tri club. And it's a really low key local event. It's not um, ITU accredited. It's not, they don't run it with official rules. It really is a have a go type of tri uh, duathlon. And the distances are 1K run, 10K bike, 1K run. Now, I contacted them and said, can I walk? They said, yes. So we are going to try that. We being me and whoever the handler is that I ended up, I end up with, I think it's going to be my friend Mary, who is also a, um, an ITU race director. What I'm not entirely sure of is how the tr how the transitions are going to work. I'm still trying to work, work it out. And I've got absolute, do not care, one jot how long it takes me to do it all. The purpose of it and the only purpose of it is to figure out how the devil to negotiate a transition from bike to run or run to bike walk when you've only got one leg and you have one handler. I have never had to do this before. So, yes, it'll be interesting. I'll report back and tell you how I went. I have a few plans, but I'm not entirely sure which way I'm going to do it yet. I'm allowed one person to help me. I'm allowed a chair in transition. What I've not yet sorted out is how to get from the bike dismount to transition, whether to use crutches or I don't know. Hmm. Anyway, all these problems you have to think about when you only have one foot, but you've not even considered that. Anyway, that's my news for this week. Stay tuned to find out how I did with that duathlon and I'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.